Yeah, we cut never fun. Nobody knows the hardships and the ups and downs of the sport better than the guys that do it. Before wrestlers hit the mat, before boxers and MMA fighters put on their gloves, competitors hone their skills in months-long training camps, building endurance and developing technique. But another, lesser-known battle complicates the fighting sports and endangers the health and longevity of each athlete. This is the battle with weight. Weight classes in sports are meant to keep unfair advantages at bay, but athletes, trainers, and nutritionists have developed drastic weight loss strategies to make competitors eligible for lower weight classes. They want to be the heaviest they can at the lightest weight class, and you start using science to get you there, and that's where we're at. Some of these people, they love the high or the rush of the weight cut. It's just nightmares of stories you hear. These kids are starving themselves, they're not drinking all day, they don't know what to do. Weigh-ins originally took place the day of the bout, but same-day weigh-ins often left fighters weak and dehydrated just hours before they would compete. If you're in a dehydrated state and that is diminished in any way, the risk for brain injury is gonna, is gonna increase greatly. My worst weight cuts, I would go deaf and blind. Then the rubber suit goes on, maybe the diuretics. I mean, you don't even have to be a, a medicine guy to understand this is not healthy. Everything happens behind the scenes and it's quite insidious. You do any means necessary to lose the weight you have to. It's, it's part of being a fighter. One of the methods or systems we use is called body metrics. And this is an ultrasound system that allows us to measure body fat. You can see that data is provided for us on how much total body water, how much lean tissue they have, how much total fat there is. And as a result of that, now we can make calculations in advance and say, well, it's certainly not gonna be safe for them to lose eight pounds of muscle tissue, so two would be the limit. Athletes in combat sports and even jockeys who race horses are mandated to compete at a designated weight. That sets into motion an increasingly dangerous dilemma. How do they stay healthy and competitive throughout the rigors of weight loss? A much different process from dieting for appearance or health. These athletes are malnourishing themselves, but cutting weight has become as integral to the sport as the event itself. I think that weight cutting has become more dangerous in the sport for a host of reasons. I think anytime first though, that the money is bigger and the purses are bigger, people will do more extreme things in order to fight, to make a fight, to take a fight on short notice. The risks of weight cutting are very, very serious, if not done correctly. You can have an increase in heart rate with as little as 1% of change in body weight. Increase in core temperature, a decrease in the way you're thinking, weakness, generalized weakness, acute renal failure, kidney stones, changes in your immune system, an increased risk for concussion during an event, if not rehydrated appropriately, an increased risk of bleeding into the brain, cardiac problems, coma, and death. Not only is weight cutting very dangerous, training is very dangerous. Because now you have an athlete who's going from zero to 60. As fighters continued to defy the norms of weight loss, the impact of blows to the brain had tragic consequences. You are much more susceptible to brain injury if you cut weight and then you're in a grueling fight. I'm always concerned about hydration because of, of brain injury. Our cerebral spinal fluid is, is, is fluid. So that's going to be our blood-brain barrier. That protects our brain from, from impact damage, from trauma. It's not coincidence that most of the tragedies in the ring where fighters have died from brain injury do not happen in the heavyweight division. Whether the body has time to rehydrate and gain a sense of normalcy depends on when the weigh-in is. In the long and rich history of boxing, weigh-ins were typically done the day of the fight. They wear black lotion, that's black. Hey, look. I remember Emil Griffith fighting Dick Tiger. Emil Griffith came in at, at 148. Dick Tiger was 159. And they did the weigh-in the morning of the fight. And then with time, 
it was determined that because of a lack of time to properly rehydrate, weigh-ins should be the day before the fight. As far back as fighters have been weighing in the day before the fight, obviously they've been put putting on a lot of weight between the weigh-in and then 36 hours later the fight. A light was shown on that when television networks, specifically the premium television networks, started doing night of weigh-ins. They would bring their own scale and weigh a fighter, and sometimes the information they got was jarring. The February 2000 Arturo Gatti Joey Gamash fight was the first high profile example of a boxer putting on an excessive amount of weight between the day before weigh in and the fight. It was revealed that Gatti gained 19 pounds overnight. I believe that Joey Gamash weighed in, give or take an ounce or two, it was like 140 and a half pounds, something like that. Gaddy weighed in about 141. It wasn't anything more than that. But the thing is, we don't know that he truly weighed in at 141. What I remember about the weigh-in is that uh, when Gaddy got on the scale, he got off just as quickly. He jumped on the scale, off the scale, and the needle has to basically rest somewhere in here. It can't touch either bar. And apparently, it just went bang. You know, I wasn't by the scale, but there seemed to be a controversy that that Arturo came in maybe, maybe, I didn't see, maybe like a half a pound, a pound heavier. And then this executive director, Tony Russo, said Arturo Gatti 141. And then Arturo jumped off the scale right away and then started drinking, you know, water, whatever. He downed it and he said, now I'm going to be overweight anyway. And he wouldn't get back on the scale. So what do you do now as uh, a commissioner? It's too late. He's already putting weight in his body. Well, the advisor for Joey Gamache, he was yelling at the commission. He said, that wasn't a real weight. Get him back on the scale. They told him to shut up and get out of the way. Just shut up and get out. Did he make the weight? I don't know. I can tell you this. New York State Athletic Commission at the time was not very good. Uh, they, they were not people who really understood the game who were running the weigh-in. The next day, you know, they, they, there was claims that Arturo Gatti weighed 159 pounds. And uh, I got called into the DA's office on it. I said, listen, you proved to me he weighed 159. Just because the guy on HBO said he weighed 159, you should be asking him where to get his information from. It doesn't matter really if they're accurate or not. What's important is what the weights are relative to each other. So if one fighter is, comes in at 159, and he's really 157, what's the difference? It's, it's what he weighs in relation to his opponent, and if he has a big advantage, then that advantage very often manifests itself in the ring. In my opinion, I don't know what a Toro Gatti weighed that night, and I don't think anybody, you could say whatever you want, but no one could prove what he weighed. The next day, Gamach weighed in, and he only weighed about 145. And apparently Arturo Gatti, when he weighed in, he had put on close to 20 pounds. He was right around the middleweight limit of 160. I remember when Arturo's robe came off and seeing how big he looked. Especially, I was, I was way in the rafters looking down and, and look, the size difference was, was incredible. He was taller, bigger, fuller. He, they, he looked like a middleweight. He, they looked like they were in three weight classes apart. Gotti looked absolutely starched to the bone yesterday. It's a different look as he gets into the ring tonight with 19 pounds of hydration having been put into his body. Joey Gamach was hurt in that fight. He was hurt badly in that fight. And the knockout, that was one of the most brutal knockouts I've seen live in my life. He's also looked so much bigger than he does. Yeah, he's got a 15 pound weight advantage. Every time he lands a shot, it's, it's abundantly clear. It was an uppercut that was flush. We're closed well before he hit the camp. There was a left hook which followed it, which spun his head. And then there was a right hand which just sent him flying backwards. He landed, his head bounced off the canvas and he was out cold. Those three punches not only ended the fight, they ended his career. His life was almost ended that night in the hospital. The second time in a row, last August 14th. That was a really glaring, you know, example of, of, of what can happen. And to this day, Joey Gamacho, at still a very young age, uh, suffers migraine headaches. You could tell it in his speech. But as far as commissions doing something like that, I mean, 
to me, that's criminal. That, that's not even wrong. That's plain out and out criminal. On the end of a lot of shots, and that's where it really hurts when you get caught on the end of these shots, like a boxer. He did good damage, but at the same time, he didn't have to throw. Put him a six pack. <laughs> when a trainer or athlete plans a meal, they're more likely to pay attention to the nutritional needs that keep the body strong and functioning at a high level. Is this video to also I mean? video. Every calorie counts during a weight cut. Proper meal preparation can be as important as training. I started off pretty heavy, and I mean, I'm a big guy. I come down from sometimes 250 and above, and I make 205. So most challenging part is just not doing, you know, Sunday dinners with my family. You know, we're Italian, so good 20 of us get together every Sunday, and I just don't go. It's too tempting. <laughs> The reality of this sport, it is a business. The day before weigh-ins, if it was just about the fighter and the safety of the fighter, I would be okay with it. But it is about the almighty dollar selling the fight. A chance for the promoters to get more uh, publicity before the fight, you stick the two fighters together, you have them square off. If I had to choose between the two, I like the day before. Because 90% of all guys, when they make a certain weight, they're not, there's only a few guys that would really blow up and become heavy. After my weigh-ins, I've gained 10, sometimes 12 pounds. But, you know, normal guys sometimes gain 20 pounds. A lot of this yo-yo weight making and dehydration and, and just, just malnutrition, really, is, is damaging to the body. Not only affects you now, it's going to affect you later. Jim Miller, who's a UFC mixed martial artist, has said that he's had upwards of 75 weight cuts throughout his career, beginning with his wrestling days. And he has said that he believes it has taken years off his life. You, you, you know, you think about your, your health, not as far as, as you as a person is concerned, but more for your family. Like me, I'm, I'm, I got kids now, I got a wife. So you think about, you know, how, how far is this gonna hurt me in the future. So there are people who are very fortunate. Uh, Chris Weidman, for example, for his fight with Damian Maya. If you look at the tapes of, of Chris during that, he looks like he's in slow motion. He wants to do things, but he can't get his body to do it. Yeah, so against Damian Maya, it was a crazy experience in my life. So I, it was actually 32 pounds in 10 days. I, asked, I did ask for a catch weight. I go, hey, I mean, is that, I mean, it's 10 days notice. Can we do like 190? I will find someone else. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll, I can make it. And I didn't realize what I was getting myself into because then I step on the scale, I weigh 217. The Maya fight was worth the risk and I was there and I witnessed it. And I think I was in tears at one point watching what this guy had to go through. But I realized the weight wasn't really coming down as fast as you needed to. So then it went to a spoonful of peanut butter for like each meal. And then it went to a spoonful of peanut butter just for a day. And then it went to me realizing I can't think straight. And like, I was not making sense when I spoke. And I remember getting down the morning of to like two and a half pounds over. And I went into, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go in the sauna for 15 minutes. And at that point, I already couldn't stand without blacking out. And you know, we got, I'm getting credit carded off, trying to get any sweat that could possibly be on me off me. I get out, I black out. As I get up, I fall onto towels. Then they finally get, walk me to the scale get to the scale, and I gained like 0.2. They didn't drop an ounce. Then he's on the floor, and I'm, I'm trying to tell him, you took it last minute, take the penalty, nobody expects you to make the weight, it was crazy. They, they, thought, I was, they, they thought I was gonna die, and I, and, I'm, and I was just telling them, I'm like, no, don't, don't. They were trying to get, they were gonna try to call Joe Silva and say he can't make the weight, and I'm like, no, don't, don't do that, don't. I, could, I, my, I had no liquid in my throat to talk. My voice wasn't working. He wanted to do it, and. I couldn't stop him, and it was a horrible thing to watch. Ray tell me, like, Chris, you have to, you know, they're gonna, the athletic commission is going to ask you questions like your name, your birthday, and all that stuff, like, and I guess they kind of make sure you're okay. And I get up there and they ask me, and I'm literally, like, feel like I'm in my pants. Like, I, I'm like, what the f Chris Weidman. And I'm, like, so nervous doing, I feel like I'm being, like, investigated for a crime because I just can't remember <laughs> and my birthday and just to get it all clearly out it was such a struggle and then finally making that weight and and somehow the next day i won the fight i don't know how I, how i did it right after the fight when we got back to the hotel room simultaneous we looked at each other and go never ever is that going to happen again and damien Maya was tough thank god he was tired too
being a jockey and being a boxer, there are a lot of similarities, you know, particularly when you talk about battling the scale and knowing what weight class you have. The major difference is, is that a jockey has to do it every single day. He doesn't have three months to prepare for a fight and get to a goal weight and then relax for a little while afterwards. A jockey doesn't have the luxury of letting down his guard, so to speak. It's not an easy job. Yeah, you're making a lot of money, but look what you have to go through to get it. I can't imagine having a job that requires you to be hungry most of the time. Be as light as I can. Every day I try to get down to 15, 14 and a half. No matter what, if the horse is in heavy, light, that's my spot. Jockeys are required to weigh in before and after every race. Each race has a set weight, a combination of the rider and the saddle, which the horse must carry. Since I'm 100 pounds, sometimes my saddle will weigh 20 pounds. And then uh, the guy next to me, his saddle could weigh two pounds. When the jockey is light, lead weights are placed in the saddle to make up the difference. If the jockey is heavy, the betting public is informed. The average jockey weighs 113 pounds. I eat what I eat and thus I eat what I need. You're constantly on a diet and you look at food just as fuel. Well, for me, I, I kind of keep light in the morning, just a coffee, just a small coffee and maybe a small snack. Coffee kills the hunger and, you know, just speeds you up a little. When I rode, I lived on about 700 calories a day, and I, I mean, I ate raw beans and I, I, you know, things that weren't for pleasure. It was just that I had to, had to feed the engine. Randy Romero is a Hall of Fame rider who's had a ton of problems with injuries and other health issues. And at 17 years old, he started flipping, which is jockey slang for inducing vomiting. Sometimes did that five times a day when he was a teenager. So imagine how miserable that makes you feel. You'd be dehydrated, hungry, dizzy, without having eaten. This was in 1983, he was one of the top riders of the country. He was at Oak Lawn Park in Arkansas. He got into a sauna, now it was an older sauna, and he wanted to sweat off a couple of pounds. And his elbow hit a light bulb. He caught on fire. Now another jockey heard the screams, came in, pulled him out, they took him to a burn unit, and by all rights, he should have died. And somehow he made it back a few months later to ride, and he won. And took him out as in third, crumb fresh, fourth, little Missouri. Fifth to the five. average person, this would seem incredibly dangerous, and they would never take these health risks. But for jockeys, it's what they have to do if they want to ride, and they're willing to do that. Tell me how you're feeling. Feeling good, man. Just uh, getting some fluids. I mean, I'm always having fun, whatever, having a good time with this stuff. I've been doing this so long, man. Jeez, I'm an old man. I started at 250, eight weeks, I'm 205, so good to go. Me and Chris do it different, you know. When I started yesterday, I only had six pounds to go. Chris had 10, so, you know, we do it differently. We did it together, but I also was cutting weight earlier in the week than he was, so. We do it a little differently, but all comes back on the same. Hey, uh, I was in the sauna, I started like vomiting, I started, there was nothing coming out, my body started like shutting down on me, I fainted twice, my body had nothing left. I come from a wrestling background where coaches just like make the weight, doesn't matter how put plastics on, put hoodies on, hop in the sauna. I had to go to the hospital one time. My liver was super messed up. I had to get IV and all that stuff. I decided to move up weight division when I lost my hearing. Like, it sounded like I was underwater. And uh, my division, my eyes started getting blurry around the edges of my vision. I've been, I've been manipulating my weight for competition since I was in like third grade, you know? I mean, I would not eat lunch, you know, and stay away from the water fountain. You know, it's a business. We're trying to make money by doing this. And if you think that dropping out of weight class is gonna give you a better chance to win, then you're, you're probably gonna do it. Just get rid of weight classes. Just screw it and, hey, I wanna fight that guy. He wants to fight me, let's do it.
I didn't do a crazy amount of weight cutting in high school. And I don't really agree with too much weight cutting at all in, in high school, um, especially at, when you're younger, when you're still going through puberty and you're growing. And because uh, it's just nightmares of stories you hear. These kids are starving themselves. They're not drinking all day. They don't know what to do, and it's very dangerous. You know, it's not good. In high school, they used to have the one mandatory uh, meeting with the doctor. He would come in and meet everybody in the high school team. He'd walk up, he'd get on a scale, and he would have a little thing, and he'd look at you up and down and say, what weight would you like to go to the lowest weight? And you could just come up with anything, and he's like, yeah, I think you could do that. And he would just sign off, and, that's your, and that would be the lowest you can go. It's, it's evolved totally since, uh, since I was in high school. John, I feel like I'm probably more than four because I have this on. You know, sometimes the parents are just as bad as the kids because they want to see their kids excel. You know, in high school, it's even worse because football season is right before wrestling season. So I was trying to get as big as possible, as strong as possible football, and then coming down. And some of the methods that I use, some of these other guys have used, sitting in a bathtub with alcohol and Epsom salt, you're pulling water from not just your, your, your muscles, but your organs, which is the scariest part. And once I realized that is when I was like, I gotta fix this. My, my high school coach said, you can't drive a car with no gas in it. Little did he know that we were empty in the morning. The education wasn't there. I mean, he was a bright man, obviously he was a great coach, but uh, he cared about us and loved us and didn't want anything bad to happen to him, but we did all those things that were really unhealthy and dangerous. The shortcut was to take, take an X-lax pill so you can eliminate any body materials in you, or worse than that was to eat, binge eat, and then throw up, and we did that. I didn't know the terminology for that until I got to college, and I was a bulimic. There's no way that my coach knew I was doing that, or any of my teammates. I would just constantly flush the toilet so they couldn't hear me gagging and throwing up. Well, it started out that uh, we would use our fingers. And then, uh, just to tell you how, how quickly it evolved, I could do it by just eating and just jumping up and down, moving my body, and it would just, like an automatic reflex. Some of my teammates used the belt. They would stick the belt down their throat, yeah, to, if, they, if they ate too much to make weight. I would go down my basement and, and exercise and push-ups and jump ropes and uh, we had an, and, 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 dis, and put the dryer on and disconnect the hose and put it down my, my, uh, my sweatsuit. All things that I would never recommend or do to myself or tell anybody to do today. It, it got to, to extremes that there were a couple of uh, collegiate wrestlers that died in a certain period, uh, probably around 97, 98. They died, uh, it was one who was a University of Michigan wrestler, was a New York State wrestler. But he was uh, one of the, the people that people started looking at, that losing 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pounds a night. So some of the techniques that we used in the past as far as saunas, rubber suits, uh, steam rooms, you know, all that stuff has been outlawed by New York State. Doesn't mean it still doesn't happen, um, but it happens a lot less frequently. It really is not cutting the weight, it's more like having to worry about it, like, like, on holidays and stuff. On Christmas I ate like 12 pounds of food and it really wasn't a problem, but I had to cut it all of it the next couple of days, that's what kind of stunk. New York State in 1997 came up with a new uh, protocol that would measure a couple different things, obviously body fat percentage, uh, dehydration or hydration ability, gro uh, growth allowance incorporated into that. At the start of each wrestling season, every boy has to uh, be certified at a certain weight. The entire team goes to a cer certain location and the very first step in that process is for the boys to uh, test for hydration. They take measurements and they weigh the boys and that will determine what is the minimum weight class that that boy can wrestle in. And uh, season ceases as soon as your weight class is not met. We're gonna have a world-class boxing back there at the Coliseum, coming to the stage to weigh in first. He fights out of You know, when I look back at my career, the, the years I, I was successful was the years that I did normal things. I ate well and I trained hard and had success. I, maybe because I didn't do it for many, many years, maybe just that one year, that uh, I'm relatively healthy from what I could tell. Oh, jockeys, you know, they, they, 
they make weight year round. If I became a jockey and continued that lifestyle, I probably wouldn't be here today. The weight cutting process remains dangerous both before and after weigh-in. After years of cutting, jockey Randy Romero's health has deteriorated. He needs both a liver and a kidney transplant. As a result of his fight with Arturo Gatti, Joey Gamache immediately retired and subsequently sued the New York State Athletic Commission for failing to properly weigh in Gatti. Gamache declined an interview request by Newsday, but issued this statement. I had to move past that night. I no longer talk about it. I do think weigh-ins are still an important issue in boxing, and when abuses occur, it puts fighters at an even higher risk. These are grown men. Their bodies, they're in the elite one less than 1% of, of an athlete. A high school athlete's not at that level. And obviously the, the paycheck at the end of the day. They realize there's a short window to make that money, and sometimes for them that, that uh, opportunity is well worth the, the risk that they're taking. Fighters see Floyd Mayweather making $100 million for one fight. The stakes are just higher than they've ever been. And the fame. I mean, you know, the, I mean, and it's such a small percentage of them compared to the hundreds of thousands that are involved in it that may be making bad choices that aren't getting the fame and the, certainly not getting the money. You, you wonder why some guys take performance enhancing drugs knowing they're going to get tested, knowing the chance of getting caught is so high, they're just looking for that little edge that's going to set them apart. These guys that are losing those 20 to 30 pounds, if they didn't do that and no one did it, they'd be fighting the same guys just in a different weight class. Because once one does it, everyone's doing the same thing. Fighters are incredibly bright um, and knowledgeable, but you have to prove it to them. But I can tell you that when I speak to fighters at, at the weigh-ins, and I'm looking for whether or not they're fit to compete, very many of them would love it if the weight cutting issue went away. Whether fighters would listen to it or not, fighters are always going to kill themselves to make weight if they have the opportunity to rehydrate and put the weight back on as a perceived advantage over their opponent. That's just always going to be the way it is. And there's no easy answer to, to solve that.